When the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was Adramitium on the northwest coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at ports along the coast of the province. The next day when we docked at Sidon, Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs. Putting out to sea from there, we encountered strong headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course. So we sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the mainland. Keeping to the open sea, we passed along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, landing at Myra in the province of Lycia. There, the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy, and he put us on board. We had several days of slow sailing, and after great difficulty, we finally neared Nidus. But the wind was against us, so we sailed across to Crete and along the sheltered coast of the island, past the Cape of Salmon. We struggled along the coast with great difficulty and finally arrived at Fair Havens, near the town of Lassia, town of Lassia. We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall. And Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. Men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on, shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. And since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. Thank you, uh, Milton, for, for reading that scripture. Um, actually, what I'm, um, what we're going to do today is 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 mainly look at um, maybe about four or five verses um, from there. Um, verses uh, one to one to five, one maybe one to four, one to five. Um, I'll read it again uh, just for. Just, just in case people didn't, wasn't able to hear it, um, or just for completeness. Um, so it says, when the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment Aristocrus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was Aradimitium on the northwest coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at ports along the coast of the province. The next day, when we docked at Sidon, Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs. Putting out to sea from there, we encountered strong headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course. So we sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the mainland. If I was going to put a title, um, to this message um it would be believe it or not um don't waste your experience um don't waste your experience um and so i, I guess with this um portion of scripture this passage i think we need to remind ourselves of where paul has come from um to get him to where he's at now so if we remember in Acts chapter 21, Paul has just left Ephesus um, and he's, he's determined in his mind that he's going to go down to Jerusalem. Um, and while he's visiting people along the way as he's leaving um, Ephesus and along the way as he's journeying down, back down to Jerusalem, he um, encounters a 
couple of brethren or, or, or believers who give him a number of prophecies. You know, the first prophecy says that, you know, the Holy Spirit has said that you should not go down to Jerusalem because um, if you do, um, you're going to be imprisoned. Then we had Agapus um, who, who took Paul's belt, if you remember, and, 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 and tied his, his feet and his hands. He said that the man who this belt belongs to um, will be brought in chains to Jerusalem. Um, and, and, and Paul had to say, look, if I have to be put in prison for the gospel, then I'm willing to. Even if I have to die, that's what I'm going to do. And so he's then, as, he, as he's, on this, he's on this trajectory now to Jerusalem, and as, we, as, we, as we've been through, he goes on to Jerusalem. He's brought in front of the Sanhedrin. He's then brought in front of Felix, then Festus and Agrippa. And at every time, the message is exactly the same. I was a persecutor of the church. I met Jesus on the road of Damascus. And I became a builder of the church. And if this this trajectory that he was on so if you remember from when he left Ephesus to where we are now it's between it's well over two years it's over three years the Bible says that 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 Felix left him in prison for up to two years and if we account for the for the time that it takes to get to these various places Paul has probably been in prison for up to three years and there's no way that he would have known the intricacies of what would have happened once he got into Jerusalem. There would have been no way that he would have understood and known the consequences of what he had done by preaching the gospel. From his point, for him, from his perspective, all he was doing from the time he was converted, that he has built churches, he has built church governments, he has made disciples, he is mentored uh, young people but then at the same time he could not have anticipated that by him preaching the gospel that he would have interrupted local economies that he would have disrupted uh, the worship of local gods that he he would have would have caused riots because of the preaching of the gospel not because he he wanted to and so from from from, from his perspective he was doing all of the right things. He was building up the kingdom of God, but at the same time, he was also helping to tear down the kingdom of Satan. And so from Paul's perspective, he was doing all of the right things. And even though he was doing all of the right things, he landed himself in prison. And although he said he was ready to go to prison, he never could have anticipated that the prison stint would have been this long, would have been up to three years. He would have been separated from his church brethren. And every time and every opportunity that he got, he managed to preach the gospel each and every time. And I think there are times in our, in our lives when we do but we feel like we've done the right thing. We have worshipped God in spirit and in truth. We have loved the Lord of all our hearts, of all our souls, of all our minds. We have, we have, we have been disciples. We have made disciples. We have, we have read the word. We have prayed. We have fasted. We have done everything. Or we have tried to do everything. We've walked in the spirit. We are trying to allow the fruits of the spirit to, to, to grow within us. We have done all of the right things, all of the right things. And all of a sudden we find ourselves in a situation that feels like a prison, that feels like we're going through suffering, that feels like we're going through a trial and tribulation. And, and we say to ourselves, how could this happen to me with an emphasis on me? I have done all the right things, God. How could you allow this to happen to me? There's a Psalm, Asaph in Psalm 73, talks about how he says that, that I almost lost my footing, he says. My feet were slipping, I was almost gone because I envied the proud. Why? 
because when I looked at them and I looked at their lifestyle and I looked at the results of what was going on in their life, there was nothing that would that would that would that would want to encourage me to live right. In fact, I could understand, he says, that if I had done wrong, that I would be in this mess. But I've done right. I've done right, and yet I'm still in this mess. Yet, yet when I see other people who do not live for you, who are not for you, who actively blaspheme your name, are prospering. God, what's going on here? I don't understand. I don't see why you're doing these things to me. It's not fair. And we, 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 we sometimes allow ourselves to, to become insular and inside because we feel like God should be taking care of us and we should not, these things should not be happening to us. Paul did all the right things. He preached the gospel. He built churches. He made disciples. He, he, he healed the sick man. He raised the dead. In fact, there were other times when he was able to escape prison, escape stoning. There were other disciples who, like Peter, who when, when Peter was in prison, the angel came for Peter. The angel came for Peter. Let open the doors and Peter escaped. But Paul, brother Paul, still in prison after two to three years. The question is, what do we do when we are still in our prison, when we're still in our tribulation, when we're still in our trials, when we're still in our sufferings, what do we do? Because at every opportunity, Paul preached the gospel. I was a persecutor of the church. I met Jesus on the road of Damascus, and then I became a builder of the church. And at every opportunity that he got, whoever his audience was, he presupposed in his heart that he was going to preach the gospel. So now, Paul is on the trajectory now to Rome now. He thought he was just going down to Jerusalem. In fact, he, he, he knew that he, he knew that his, his whole intention was to go down to Rome. But he didn't know it was going to be like this. And so now, he's on this trajectory. He's on this purpose now. He's on this path that is set in motion. That now he is on his way to Rome. And so as we see here, he's about to set sail. He's getting on a ship with a man named Julius, a centurion, captain. He would have looked after at least maybe between 80 to 100 guards would have been under his authority. And they set sail. The Bible says in verse 3 that the next day we docked in Sidon. Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs. We don't know why Julius showed kindness to Paul. The Bible does not say. Julius was a, from all we know, Julius was an unbeliever. He was a Roman. He did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But for some reason, he showed Paul kindness. Even though Paul was in the midst of his tribulation, even though Paul was in the midst of his suffering, even though Paul was on, was on his way from one jail to another, God provided room for someone who was an unbeliever at this particular moment in time to provide kindness to Paul. And I think, and I believe, just like if we, if we, we were talking last week or a couple of weeks ago, when, 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 Brother Joseph was in prison. And for some unknown reason, the prison guard shown kindness to Joseph where he became in charge of the prison and the prisoners. In fact, the prison guard did not even check the work that Joseph was doing. Even in the midst of Joseph's prison, God allowed a moment and an, an instance, an environment where kindness was shown. Even when the children of Israel were going through their wilderness period and they were they were complaining for, for quail and they were complaining for water, even in the midst of the wilderness, the Lord provided opportunity for quail. They moaned about manna. Lord, why are we always having manna? Can we have something else? And the Lord gave them quail. We were thirsty. The Lord gave them water. 
even in the midst of their wilderness. Now, now, what's interesting is that we are predisposed that whenever we're going through something difficult, whenever we're going through something hard, whenever we're going through a suffering, we want it over as soon as humanly possible. But I feel and I think that actually God gives us reprieve and respite and a blessing in the storm, not so that we can get out of it, but so that God can take us through it. And that's not our natural disposition. When we see, when we feel like we're getting kind of shown to us in the midst of suffering, we feel that this must be God taking us out of the suffering. But if you remember, when God gave the children of Israel the manna and the quail and the water and the fire by night and the, and the cloud by day, it wasn't to take them out of the wilderness, it was to take them through it. Because God has already had a plan and a purpose that before we entered into this trial or tribulation, God wanted us to learn something from it for us to be closer to him, to be become more conformed to his image because of this. Now, we have to be careful, therefore, that when we're going through our trials and tribulations, that we don't become bitter instead of better, that we don't become hateful instead of hopeful. We have to ensure that the plan and purpose that God has for us during this period is that we are looking towards Jesus Christ. Paul, and if we also remember also, Paul was on the ship with, with people who could have been murderers, who could have been heinous people. And Julius allowed him to come off board and go and see his friends. What that means is that Julius gave Paul trust. He trusted him to come back. He trusted him, even if there were guards going with him, they could have orchestrated some sort of plan where Paul could have escaped. Can you imagine Paul went back to his prison? He went back to his prison. He didn't allow, he, 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 he saw something bigger than what God was trying to show, what, what he wanted to do. And he, he was on the path of what God was trying to show him, what God was trying to do for him. And the point there is then, is that even in our midst of tribulations and trials, or in our, in our prisons, there's gonna be people that show us kindness. There's going to be people that's going to show us favor. We looked at, you remember, you know, we, you know, we looked and we were looking, talking about Joseph. And every time something bad happened to Joseph, the scripture before said, and the Lord was with Joseph. And we were joking at how if the Lord was with Joseph, I, won't, I don't want to see what it was like if God was against Joseph. But every, but, but every time Joseph was given favor, he did not break the trust that was given to him. And that's a lesson for us that when we're given favor, when we're given an opportunity, when we're given something that is not usual in the, in the particular circumstances, we have to ensure, and this is what David was talking about yesterday in a men's breakfast, that we maintain the trust that's given to us. We have to ensure that we are maintaining not just our reputation, but the reputation of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we don't maintain that trust, it will just be taken away from us. And so Paul, went back to his prison. The second point then is that the Bible says that he went and saw his friends in Sidon. Now, who were these friends in Sidon? Those friends in Sidon were from Acts chapter 21. When he Paul left Ephesus, the Bible says that he went down to meet the believers in Sidon. And when he met the believers in Sidon, the Holy Spirit, they gave us a prophecy through the Holy Spirit telling them not to go to Jerusalem. And so he has now come full circle back to those believers in Sidon. And it said that he, it said that he went there so that he could get what he needed. The question is that the point is, is that Paul knew where he needed to go to get what he needed. I don't doubt for a second that Paul may have had feelings of doubt and of fear. And, of, and, and whether is God with me or because Paul was an honest man if you check Romans 7 he says that you know the things that I, 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 I want to do I find myself not doing the things that I don't want to do I find myself doing oh wretched man am I 
Paul was an honest man. He 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 had an honest opinion of who he was as himself. He 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 looked at himself in an objective manner. In fact, he looked at himself through the lens of the word and the Holy Spirit, and he knew what type of man he was. And so he knew that he needed to go to a set of believers that was going to give him what he needed at that particular time. The Bible doesn't go into much detail about what was said or what was done. All we know, it says, verse 3 says, so they could provide for his needs. The question is, who are we allowing to speak into our needs? Are, are we getting the right strength? Are we getting the right word? Are we getting the right advice? Are we... Are, who? Who is controlling our environment? Who is controlling our thinking? Who is speaking into our lives? When Paul, Paul's first opportunity, when he was allowed to come off board in a prison experience, he went to the believers. He went to the body of Christ. What is when we're going through suffering? When we have an opportunity to get to for someone to care for our needs, who are we going to? Are we going to our friends who are not going to give us godly wisdom and advice? Or, or, or are we going to YouTube? Or, or who are we going to? Because at the end of the day, when we look at it, Paul understood that this was a one-way track to Rome. He wasn't getting out of it. He was on his way to Rome. He couldn't, he wasn't, he couldn't escape. He and he he understood. And if you and if you if you notice the Paul, but just by silence. The scripture doesn't say that the believers in Sidon tried to dis dissuade him from going back to back on the ship. So it means that they knew, they understood what was going on here. Sometimes you need people in your life that can understand the plan and purpose for your life, even sometimes beyond what you can see. That's why we have mentors. That's why we have elders and, and fathers in the church. The Bible talks about how that, that we have many teachers, but not many fathers. Why? Because fathers are able to see into the future. They are vi God gives them vision to see. And sometimes we need people not only to just speak into our lives, but to care for our needs, to strengthen us, to get us through the wilderness, through our trials, through our suffering and not take us out. Because an immature Christian will want to take you out of the suffering. But a mature Christian will see what God is doing. Just like even Eli, even Eli, even Eli was able to, to see and hear that God was calling Samuel. So sometimes it takes for people who have heard the voice of the Lord, who has seen that experience, who has been through that trial and tribulation and understands that actually God is trying to create in you pure gold. That sometimes you have to go through the fire so that all the dross can come up to the top and sieve you out. And if we understand then that as because the fact that and we, we have to under, we have to know if we remember that Paul, even during all of this, when he was on this road to Rome and, 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 and the next speaker will speak about what happens next with the storm and everything else. But, you know, he was shipwrecked to Malta. There was a ministry there. But. If we fast forward to, 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 to when he was in Rome, he was, he was in prison for a number of years. Out of his prison ministry, out of his house arrest ministry, he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, some of the greatest theological books ever that we still has reverberations to this day. So had he not obeyed, had he not gone on that trajectory to Rome, we would not have some of these books right now. And that means that sometimes our suffering is not just for us. Sometimes our suffering is for other people. We don't fully understand why we're going through what we're going through. But sometimes the suffering and the trial and tribulation is actually not just for you. It's actually for someone else. It's actually that what God places inside of you during that, that suffering that is going to manifest 5, 10, 15 years down the line because God has shaped you into his image now. We have to understand that sometimes it doesn't make sense. And Paul could not have known this. This is the point I want to get ahead. He did all the right things. He did all the right things. And there is no way Paul could have understood what was going to happen next. And so I know sometimes we, we're gonna feel we're gonna feel that it's not fit. We're gonna feel we're it's gonna we're, we're gonna feel discouraged. We're gonna feel that you know does God actually really care for me? 
But it's not for us to come out the storm. It's not for us to come out of the storm. It's not for us to come out of the prison. It's not for us to come out of the wilderness. It's for us to go through the wilderness. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But if it's not possible, Father, I will, I will, I will, I will submit to you. But if it at all be possible, and he asked three times, he prayed so much that the Bible says that his sweat looked like drops of blood. It means he was praying all through the night. And this is Jesus Christ that we're talking about. And he was, even he was petitioning the Father, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But he knew that he couldn't avoid the cross because because of the cross, now we have salvation and not just that we have salvation from from death but we now have new life in christ and that we're able then to cast all our cares on him that we're then able to have the holy spirit to walk to live and walk in us and so sometimes it's not about coming out of suffering you know i was i was listening to um uh, miles Monroe's book um, overcoming crises and he was talking about this book was written during the financial crisis um, and it's so apt for today but one of his points was is that a lot of Christians are going to be praying for the crisis to end and he said there's no point there's no point of praying for that because it's already set it's already set in motion God's not going to take away the financial crisis he said instead what you sh- instead of trying to pray that the financial crisis ends you should pray God how can you help me through this financial crisis and actually is there an opportunity that i need to see in this crisis that you can put me onto because he was saying that the the word crises in in japanese and chinese is opportunity and so it all depends on our perspective and that's why you know if if we are like paul paul and joseph did not allow the situation to change the message and purpose that he had. Whatever was inside of Paul did not change. The situation did not change him. The prison did not change him. The suffering did not change him. The trial did not change him. In fact, it made him more steadfast. In fact, it made him more disciplined. In fact, it gave him more faith. The situation did not change him. When Joseph was let out of the prison, and even when he was forgotten by the baker, it did not change him. He still went and interpreted those dreams. God still allowed the gift to stay with him. When Paul was going through the situation, every time, as I said in the beginning, every time an opportunity was given for him to stand in front of people, the gospel was preached. We have to allow to make sure that that the situation does not overcome us. That whatever God has placed in our hearts, whatever plan and purpose that God has placed, it doesn't change. Because although it's going to get hard, although it's going to get rocky, although the the winds and and, and the sea will will, will try and tip you over, and in fact, you might land in the water. In fact, you 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 might hit a rock. In fact, you might be struggling for your life. Don't let that change what God has put in you. Because you don't know, just like Esther, that for such a time as this, that this situation is there to make you stronger and better in the Lord. And so he allowed, he made sure that the kindness that was shown to him cocooned him. That even in the midst of the storm, someone said there's a blessing in the storm. That even in the midst of that, Sometimes we have to wrap ourselves around with the word. Sometimes we have to wrap ourselves around with the brethren. Sometimes we have to wrap ourselves around with worship in and amongst all of the craziness that's going on because it doesn't make sense. But the Bible says, and it talks about that, that sometimes a raven can come just in the midst of the storm. That even manna can come in the wilderness. That even water can come in the wilderness. And so we got to make sure then. 
prison won't kill us. The situation won't kill us. What kills is a lack of faith, hope, and love. But well, the Bible says that through the Holy Spirit, God provides us all free. And that's why the songwriter said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When we're going through our trials and tribulations and suffering, we need to make sure that we are looking in the face of Jesus. Because if we look to our left and to our right, we might stumble and we might fall. That's why David said that even though a, a, a thousand may fall at one side and 10,000, nothing will come nigh to me. Why? Because my face is set like a flint to look upon Jesus Christ. And if we allow ourselves to focus on him, it doesn't mean we ignore the situation. It doesn't mean that we're not acknowledging what, what's going on with COVID and the deaths. No, we're going to pray for that, of course. But we got to set our face to Jesus Christ because it's through and in him that he's going to take us through this. We know that the world is not going to be the same after this. Not to say that you know, social distancing and etc. What I mean, there's a shift that's happened in the environment, that's happened in the spiritual world. And we've got to make sure that we are that we are attuned to that shift. And once we are attuned to that shift, we set our face on Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that sometimes that now that we're at home, we're going to have to learn to worship by ourselves. We're going to have to learn to sing those songs by ourselves. It doesn't mean if you sound bad, I don't sound great either. But I'm going to have to learn to invoke the presence of the Lord in my room. It means that I'm going to have to pray and fast all night when no one's telling me to. It means that I'm going to have to sit down at my table and study and chop up the word. It means then that I'm going to have to make sure that I'm making an effort to speak to my neighbours about Jesus Christ. It means that during these times that I have to ensure that the, that the Lord is working in and through me because there is fear all around. And that's why the songwriter said that song is so apt that once we turn our face to Jesus, the things of this world become inconsequential in the light of the context, in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Thank you for listening to the message today. We hope it blessed you. And if it did, please like, comment and subscribe for more videos from Micah. And don't forget to click the notification bell to see when they're uploaded. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you in the next one.